I modified my title a little bit. Uh, I was asked to talk about left side, and I don't really think about them that differently, left and right, in terms of how I approach it. And I want to show you why, because I think that will really answer your question. So first, I just wanted to comment in terms of imaging. What, left or right, um, uh, all the guidelines, ASCO, uh, uh, Clinical Care Ontario, NCCN, uh, contrast enhanced CT is what's recommended. MRI uh, is the backup. And CT PET is not recommended for anything in colorectal cancer. And as I mentioned in a, a previous uh, discussion, uh, I'd say two thirds to three quarters of the cases that are referred to us at Sloan Kettering from outside come with a PET, uh, proudly telling us what the PET shows. And frankly, there is an awful lot of false positive on PETs, which I have come to call PET poop. Um, that can really lead you down the wrong uh, pathway. So I, I, I urge you to think carefully about that. Um, also, while this is a molecular tumor board, as, as I mentioned in my earlier comments, to some degree, molecular biology in colorectal cancer is aspirational. We have inclusionary and exclusionary markers, uh, things that tell us you can't use what you wanted to versus things that tell us here's a new idea. That, the inclusionary, here's something new you wouldn't have thought of, is something we're always looking for, but we're rarely finding. So remember that the first thing we want to look for is mismatch repair status. And I'm going to leave the talk of MSI for another time because that's obviously now we understand a completely different disease. But we want to understand that the cases we're talking about are mismatch repair proficient or microsatellite stable. And then we need to know at some point, but I would argue not from the moment we start therapy, the KRAS and NRAS mutation status, the BRAF mutation status, and the HER2 amplification status. We can use NGS for this and we get a lot of information, uh, but as I mentioned in uh, uh, comments uh, uh, last week or a week ago, um, this is a study that uh, my former fellow Rajiv Agarwal uh, published with me last year, looking at our experience, looking for creative ideas in GI oncology patients, we had almost 400 people internally referred from our GI service to our phase one drug development group. We only referred people that were in good shape with good organ function. And even of those, only 13% got on a clinical trial. And it's important to remember that getting on the clinical trial isn't the endpoint; it's benefit. And of benefit, we saw none. No patients on at six months, only two people on with slowly progressive disease at three months and off a month later, and not a single patient with any evidence of tumor shrinkage. This in our really robust phase one group. So I, it's sobering, but I think it's important to keep that in mind. And why is my thing not moving now? There we go. So how do I treat uh, this disease? Uh, for first-line therapy, left or right side, Fulfox, Kpox, and Fulfiri are all equally acceptable. I think in terms of personalized medicine, this is where we break down and talk to the patient and find out what he or she values. Consider patient preference in side effect profile. I had a patient in clinic yesterday where we were talking about Fulfox or Fulfiri. And I was leaning for the second reason here that I favor full theory as a first treatment if there's extensive liver involvement, because I can give a renotecan if the billy is still good. And if failure, I can give full fox even if the billy is markedly abnormal without dose modification. So I get the renotecan in when I can. But he said to me, my daughter is getting married next month. If I don't have my hair, people are going to be looking at me instead of her. Hair loss was the critical factor for this man, and therefore full fox has less, or K-Fox would have less risk of that, and that can guide therapy. So understanding the individual preference can be hugely important in terms of the quality of life for the patient. And K-Fox, I would mention, is only if the patient is willing, able, and motivated, because you need someone to follow a complex schedule of taking pills, and not too old, because when you get over 70, the creatinine clearance gets a little bit funky and cytopene dosing becomes a little bit more complicated. If you use oxaliplatin, 
Optimoxing is, I consider, standard of care, dropping the oxaliplatin out after the first three months and telling the patient on day one that that's the plan so that he or she is aware that that's going to happen so they don't panic when you say now we're taking the oxaliplatin away. What I like to do, unburdened by any direct data, is add bevacizumab when I remove the oxaliplatin because the 966 data showed us that we don't get any benefit with Bev when added to oxali. And if I use Fulfiri, uh, I use that with Bevacizumab, either reference uh, a Vastin or a biosimilar, I have no preference. So for those of you uh, not overly familiar with the, the Optimox study, this was done uh, by uh, Christophe Turnigan and Amory de Gamont's group in Paris. Um, reported about 15 years ago, where they showed that if you drop the oxaliplatin out after three months versus continuing Fulfox all the way through, that all the efficacy parameters were the same, progression-free survival, duration of disease control, overall survival, but of course, toxicity was much lower. Um, now, this is uh, some data that Jim Cassidy and I published uh, uh, in JCO about 15 years ago as well, or almost. Um, and uh, looking at bevacizumab in conjunction with oxaliplatin-based therapy. And we showed that there was a modest PFS advantage of 1.4 months or 43 days, which technically made it a positive study. But what I'm showing you here are the only data on the planet for Kpox and Folfox separately with Bev. This was a huge study with 1,400 patients randomized globally. And so this subset here is 700 patient randomized comparison of Fulfox placebo versus Fulfox Bev. And you can see that there was no benefit whatsoever. So I am not anxious to use Bevacizumab with oxaliplatin. I add it in when we lose it. Uh, this just shows you that there was really very trivial survival benefit um, 1.4 months, again, 43 days, uh, just missing significance, but I would say it's, uh, we can say with 92% confidence that it was real. There was no response benefit, and that's really important to understand. Fulfox, Kpox plus placebo, response rate 49%, plus Bev, 47%, same number. And this study is, the, is as large as the two previous studies that to show a response, it's the only one that is double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled with third-party radiology review. It's as large as the other two. I don't like it. I wish it weren't true, but I believe these data are real. BEV does not add to the response rate with oxaliplatin-based therapy. Now, some caveats. I like to consider treatment-free intervals if things are going well after six to nine months. Patients love to respond to chemo, but they really love to get off of it. Um, also, if you use oxaliplatin in the first line, second line, once they've progressed through Folfox or Kpox, there's really no synergistic interaction between fluoropyrimidines and arenotecan. They're additive. And if they progress through Folfox or Kpox, they're fluoropyrimidine resistant. So I use arenotecan with BEV and without the 5-FU thereby sparing them the toxicity and sparing them the headache of the pump. Now, what about the triplet combination, Fulfox Erie, which by the way, is not exactly the same as Fulfirinox, um, same letters, slightly different dosing. Um, it's appropriate to consider this only in ECOG zero patients who really need a major and or rapid response. These are the Fulfox Erie data um, uh, with, with BEV, uh, showing uh, purportedly a survival benefit, um, which is why uh, there's discussion of using this, but some important caveats about this triplet combination data. Firstly, note in full Fox Erie, 3,200 milligram per meter squared of 5-FU, as opposed to the standard 2,400 milligram per meter squared over the two-day period. That's a big difference. That's not a dose that I am comfortable giving to patients, at least in the U.S. Um, and uh, that's where uh, using this dose 
brings us into the Fulfirinox scale rather than the Fulfox Erie treatment. Now, here's the problem with the study and why I don't feel swayed by it. First of all, everybody was ECOG zero. Nobody was over 75, and they had to be truly ECOG zero to get on over age 70. So this is not meant for older patients. Everybody's ECOG zero, and yet 22% never got a second line oxaliplatin containing regimen after failure on fulfiri bep. That's odd, and that's unsettling, and that makes me doubt um, that there's a major difference if you do, in fact, plan on giving second line therapy. It's hard to believe that 22% of people that were ECOG zero for first line treatment were unable to be well enough for second line. Twice as many people were off of everything at six months on the Fulfiri Bev arm, and I don't understand why that should be. We know now, I'll show you the data in a moment, that right-sided lesions um, have half the prognosis of left-sided lesions, and yet there was a striking imbalance, oops, sorry, striking imbalance in terms of more right-sided lesions on the Fulfiri arm. And liver only is actually a favorable prognosis, and that was uh, favored in the full Fox Erie arm. So with that, let me move to the question that comes up when somebody says, how do you treat left-sided, and why I don't favor penetumumab or cetuximab in the first-line setting. First of all, I would say that penetumumab, cetuximab, essentially equal I like penetumumab a little better because it was designed for an every other week schedule. It's a little more convenient, um, but dealer's choice. Um, they're only potentially active if all of the following are true. Has to be all RAS wild type, has to be BRAF wild type, has to be non-amplified for HER2, and has to be left-sided. Any one of these being untrue makes the drug effectively inactive. But the major problem, excuse me, the major problem is that skin rash correlates with activity, and the skin rash of the EGFR agents, I would argue, is one of the nastiest things I ask my patients to tolerate. So I put my thoughts in a paper, I, I'll show you the reference for it here, uh, about six years ago. Um, I wanted to just uh, entitle it, I don't give uh, EGFR agents to my left-sided RAS wild type patients, and I don't think you should either. Uh, the editors uh, made that the opening line rather than title. But anyway, the let's not be rash, I think, gets the concept across. The data that I discuss in that are from the combination of the 80405 study and the FIRE 3 study. 80405 was a randomized study of dealer's choice, full theory or full fox, and then randomized to cetuximab or bevacizumab, EGFR or VEGF. And the end of the story is very obvious in this graph. There was no difference. There was no difference by different chemotherapy arms. Uh, there was no difference in PFS or overall survival. No difference except other than the skin rash. The FIRE 3 study asked virtually the same question, but purported to come up with a different answer. So I want to show you why that doesn't sway me. Firstly, it's half the size of 80405. Secondly, it was industry-sponsored, run by the company that markets cetuximab. This doesn't invalidate it, but it must give us pause. And it was Fulfiri plus either cetux or bevacizumab. The pre-specified primary endpoint was response. And that is a very odd pre-specified primary endpoint for a randomized phase three study. It, would, it is what I would have expected to favor cetuximab because before the study, I would have guessed that cetuximab would do better on response and bevacizumab might do better on progression-free survival. I would have been wrong because in fact, it was a negative study. There was not a statistically significant difference in the response rate. The p-value here is 0.18. So FIRE-3 is a negative study. The pre-specified primary endpoint was negative, not statistically significant, not even close. And therefore, anything we conclude from it is at best hypothesis generated. Now, the first thing they did is sort of the first red flag in data you should doubt, which is came up with a quote, accessible subpopulation. 
Here, they found statistical superiority for cetuximab, but that's because they excluded early death, allergic reaction, or a person who got fewer than three cycles. Why should we exclude those people? They count. It didn't work for any of those people. Nevertheless, here's the PFS, and not even a GI oncologist can get a laser pointer between those curves. So no difference in progression-free survival between cetuximab and bevacizumab. Here's where it splits and gets interesting. There appears to be better survival with cetuximab, but it occurs two years after initiation of therapy and long after PFS and people are off the treatment. So where did this come from? Probably came, I would argue, because cetuximab in RAS wild type patients has a very dramatic survival benefit in the salvage setting. So for people who did not get cetuximab in first line, did they all get it in second line? The answer is no. As presented, the data implied that almost half of people got it, and even that would be low. But in reality, this is 43% of only the subset of patients that got any second line therapy. Again, first line uh, uh, eligible for phase one study, that's small. In reality, only 28% got a second line EGFR agent. And I think that explains the imbalance. So um, here are the data from 80405 showing the incredibly insufficient activity on the right side of the colon with cetuximab um, uh, compared with uh, bevacizumab. And this is the data on which uh, NCCN recommended not using EGFR on the right side they allow it to be used on the left side. And my argument is simply, I can save that skin rash for later. This is what the skin rash looks like. This is a socially debilitating rash. And for a person who's gonna be living for years with first line disease, it's very hard to exist with that kind of skin rash. And as has been shown in every study that looks at these data, this is the PFS for a grade three skin rash versus a grade two skin rash versus a grade zero to one skin rash. And the arrow here shows you the control arm. So if you give cetuximab and don't get a rash, patients actually trend inferior to having not gotten cetuximab alone. Uh, quick last comment, BRAF mutation present in 8% of colorectal cancer and a bad prognostic indicator. Uh, Scott Kopitz and I tried bemirafenib years ago. It didn't work. Uh, that was very surprising and disappointing to us. Ultimately, uh, Scott uh, stayed with it, pushed on and showed that there would be activity when you gave EGFR inhibition and BRAF. This was the preliminary first result published in JCO with a 48% response. Never believe that. When we get down to the randomized phase three, it's down to 26%. And when we get to oral presentation after the publication, we find out that in fact, there was no benefit to MET inhibition, uh, MEC inhibition with binometinib. And so if we're going to target, we target with just EGFR and anti-BRAF. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna talk about HER2 much other than just to say, if the patient is RAS wild type and HER2 amplified, then dual HER2, whether you do it with trastuzumab and lopatinib, trastuzumab and pertuzumab, or with uh, trastuzumab deruxetecan shows meaningful activity. However, it's only if you have true HER2 amplification and only if it's RAS wild type. So in conclusion, any of the doublets are equally acceptable for first line. BEV adds to 5-FU and arenotecan, but not to oxaloplatin. Each of our skin toxicity is nasty, so I leave it for last. HER2 agents are active only in HER2 amplified RAS and RAF wild type. EGFR agents are not active if HER2 amplified. Uh, Shaina, so, you go first, then I have a question as well here. Okay, because, you know, now that I've, I'm a complete opportunist and I want to ask my question, even though we're, we're running out of time. 
Um, I'm going to be very direct. Patients with HER2 amplified disease, and you get to know this information right up front. Why are we waiting on using anti-HER2 therapy? Why can't we use it up front in these patients when we know it's going to work? I sometimes wonder why we're, we're waiting until two, three lines of therapy, because at every tumor board I've been on, that's what people are ac- advocating, and I'm not convinced. Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting question, and I don't have a good answer for you. Um, but, it's, but uh, you know, that's usually the case with a good question. Um, and um, I've wondered also why we're hung up on either, you know, HER2 doublets or Durexatecan, but virtually nothing with a cytotoxic specifically as, you know, has been, you know, uh, look, breast cancer is where we're learning about HER2 and where it's been leveraged to the most benefit. So um, I think perhaps part of the answer is, if you are dealing with a rarefied subtype, uh, RAS wild type, RAF wild type, HER2 amplified, um, and uh, by the time you get that information to get people on a clinical trial and or to randomize them, because of course there's activity with the chemotherapy, designing the clinical trial is easy, but I fear our grandchildren will close it for lack of a cool. So, um, you know, I, it's probably a reasonable thought, but it's going to be very hard to validate it. And especially one of the unfortunate ways that regulatory authorities are dealing with expensive drugs is being incredibly concrete about the subset that was studied. And so since all the studies are done in refractory patients, often reimbursement is limited to that population. So your point is well taken. It's very likely that either upfront combinations or earlier combinations with cytotoxics would have activity, but nobody has tested that hypothesis in the study yet. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So one last thing, Ellen, if you have a patient with unresectable liver metastasis, liver limited, what is your liver directed treatment of choice? Do you go for radiation or HAI or, uh, or CERT? Uh, probably do a whole separate talk on that. It's not an easy one. Um, I think CERT has negative data uh, at this point, so I, I'm, I'm not a big fan. And my, my personal experience when I have sort of contradicted myself and given CERT a trial is it's got much more toxicity than we wanted to believe. Where I do like CERT is in very focused use. For example, I had a patient with BRAF mutated disease getting great control with BRAF therapy and then a solitary breakthrough lesion and we gave a focal ablative dose of CERT to that one lesion, and he's now been continuing on his encarapinib and uh, panitumumab for another two years and still going. Um, uh, The hepatic artery infusion pump is a very complicated question. Uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering puts in as many as the rest of the world, and I'm not proud of that. That just means we haven't done our job. We have not either convinced ourselves we were wrong or convinced the world we were right. My politically incorrect opinion there, we put in far too many pumps and the world puts in far too few and the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, There's no one answer to your question and we could talk about that, you know, perhaps as a separate topic another time. That's great. Thank you so much, Len. Really grateful. We'll uh, thank you everyone else as well for being here. So we'll meet next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.